This week's episode of Dylan Friends is brought to you by Pilot. Pilot is an online men's health clinic for blokes. You don't have to book an awkward consultation with anyone and wait in the waiting room. This is all online. You even get your treatments delivered to your front door. And now you can get a free online doctor's consultation using the code DIL. That's D-Y-L. Honestly, why would you not do this? So head to pilot.com.au forward slash DIL to start your consultation. Stop putting off the chat and get on top of your health. Do it for me. I love you. Now back into the show. Jack Boats, welcome to Dylan Friends Podcast, my friend. This is a big, big moment for me. Big fan of yours. First podcast in the new studio. I love it. It's very cool. But it definitely has first show vibes because it's very empty. <laughs> <laughs> I was expecting some congratulations. No, no, yeah. congratulations. No, it's very cool. I mean, I didn't see where you came from, but it's yeah. great. Thank you. No, I appreciate it. Hey, honoured to have you in. Big fan of your work for a long time. You've done a lot of things. Thank you, man. A lot of things. And one thing I'm so surprised, I didn't realise how tall you were. You're a big boy. Thanks, man. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what to say. I, like, you've got some, some real presence. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, you were taller than I thought you were as well. Oh, that, that is not no, a compliment, not, man. That you, were, is you, not, you are, you are. But that's like saying that I must have been, like, you must have thought well, I was TV, really... Well, on TV, I guess against football, as you look kind of shorter. Not short. I would never use that word. Yeah. But you look shorter. But you're not short. Oh, I am. I would say that I'm. No, you're a you're a straight up medium sized man. Yeah, I'd say that medium. <laughs> it's actually funny you say medium because um, and the way you, I like your clothing, I asked you what size you were before, and you said large. I was like, mm. oh, that might be a bit baggy. Maybe he likes the oversized. Mm. But reason I'm bringing this up. Oh, you thought I was lying about my size? No, I, I didn't think you were lying. But like, it's such I'll an go easy ahead and thing. Get you a medium. It's so. such an easy thing to say is like your size. You never know what to say. Yeah. Because for me, like, if someone said what size are you, I'd say large. Mm. Because I don't necessarily like wearing things really tight. Mm. Whereas I am probably a medium. Uh, I, bought a, I bought a small for my um, podcast merchandise to give you, so I'll have to pack that away. Yeah, <laughs> don't bring that out. <laughs> unless it's, I need it medium at least. Because I, I get self-conscious about the size of my chest. I need it to be like looser on my body. Why? You don't want your chest to look too strong. i got strong. big pecs, yeah. I've <laughs> <laughs> never had that problem. Yeah, I, I don't even know that was a thing to be self-conscious about. No, it's not. It's, it's more like making other people self-conscious about them. So it's a well, thing thanks I for do. wearing loose-fitting clothing today <laughs> so you didn't make me feel uncomfortable. <laughs> hey, mate. Um, so much to get through today. First thing I want to talk to you about, though, is mm. something when we're doing a research. We've got a big research team here. Um, Sam and Sam, Damon. Can I say up front, I don't know if you, you can cut this out if you want, but yeah. you are a great interviewer and I love the pod. And I, I, I'm surprised it took me so long to come to it because I was aware of it for a very long time, but not till you asked me to come on did I thought, well, I'll sample it. Yeah. And you're, you're really, I'm not just saying that because I'm sitting across from yeah. you now, but you're a great interviewer and it really is an offering that you don't get other places with those kind of people. Like with football, I listen Thank to the, uh, Gorney and I listen to Alex Rance and you really don't get insight to those guys unless they're talking to someone who's a peer of theirs and you make them feel really comfortable and the interviews are really good so i guess people who are listening to this now already know about the podcast so it's it's pointless to spruik <laughs> no, your podcast to people who are already listening but you could make it into a clip or something on the video if you want <laughs> <laughs> and push no, it out i there. really appreciate it mate that's that's huge and not just saying this someone that's come from your stature and done what you've done and worked on what you've worked with Hamish and Andy, Christian O'Connell and your own projects, which we'll get to today. It means a lot. So I really do appreciate it. You are not just a man of radio and presenting and physical good looking the stature. You are actually a handyman. A little bit. No, well, yeah. Okay. You're a handyman at the moment. Little... COVID, like you're building your own house. Yeah. The house is done. You thankfully. built your own house. Yes. I mean, there is an asterisk to that, which is I had help. Like there was carpenters and stuff working with me, but mm. I can do, I've come a long way from knowing nothing. Like if you got, if you put out a range of tools on this table and asked me to name them, I probably could get four out of five. What's your favorite? Love the hammer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Love the hammer. <laughs> no, honestly, I didn't use too many tools. Yeah. I got, I actually got, I thought I was going to become like Mr. Carpenter mm. and I actually got a bunch of tools. I even got like the, um, the nail guns, which they're cool. They're cool. And they're the expensive ones. When you, people would know who yes. are in, who tradies would know they're, they're the expensive ones and they got pinched out of my car. Cause I'd, another thing which tradies would know, you don't leave them in your car don't for people to see them because they smash the window and take mm. the tools. So the tools went, 
And then all I had left was the trusty hammer. So I just did a lot of watching after that of yeah. the carpenter's work and I didn't do a lot of it myself. Because I saw on, um, and just side note here, I get distracted quite a bit, but I saw mm. recently, did you have a tool deal on Hamish and Andy? Is that true? You had like a, you had a, a drill sponsor? Yeah, we, no, we didn't. Hey, you know what? Some sponsors like, of all the podcasts out there, Hamish and Andy's like number one in Australia, right? So it's, it's expensive to advertise, advertise with mm. them. But sometimes companies just get like complete freebies by sending stuff in. So Makita was one of the complete freebies. <laughs> the guy, a guy from Makita sent in hoodies for them for us all yeah. and said, hey, we'll give you some tools. And that was enough to go like, all right, well, you can have the podcast sponsorship. We'll wear the Makita hoodies for a little bit. And then... I said that I was a DeWalt guy because I already had the DeWalt batteries at home. So yellow. I was like, oh, yeah, the yellow, yeah. yeah. So I was like, maybe DeWalt will hear this yeah. and then they'll send me a bunch of tools like Hamish and Andy are getting the Makita tools. But then DeWalt never came to the party. And so, and I'm not proud to say this, I went back through the producer of the show and asked for the contact, contact of the guy from Makita and said, hey, I'm Jack. I spoke badly of Makita and talked highly of DeWalt on the show, but I would like to take that back. And if there's still some free Makita tools to give away, I would really like to take you up on that. And so I did get a impact driver and a hedge trimmer from Makita. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, there's only one bloke on par or worse than you than this. And it's producer though, Sam Bonzer. He goes through like the DMs of every brand mm. And he's not probably man enough as you to like email them. He probably gives brands the, I, they think they're probably talking to me or Dan, going, like, and then he uses that yeah. and says, hey, send this in, send it to this address. And they think that they're giving it to us. So I'm getting walking around getting angry eyes from all these brands out there that think that I've got their product. It's not me. It's Sam's the one that's got it. Yeah, and they think it's you that's been the little weasel, right? Yeah. But it's him. Yeah. And it's easy to do it under somebody else's name. Yeah. It's hard to cross that bridge for yeah. yourself to go, hello, this is Jack writing to you. Yes. And Jack would like some Makita tools. Like, no, you weasel. <laughs> hey, let's go back to, to your story, mate, because it's been um, incredible. I feel like, and I think this is a big compliment to yourself and the team you work with, but I feel mm. like I've like, like grown up with you. Like, oh, I, thanks, I really... Man feel like even like today when i saw you there was that sense of uh familiar familiarity i hate that word as well i wouldn't that even try freaking and hard you. to say yeah. man <laughs> familiarity anyway there was that and i saw you i was like i know this guy and the first time i ever laid eyes on you was when i was at home i was watching i reckon i don't know how old i would have been but it was i was watching like one of the hamish nanny gap years and you're in the u.s yeah i think and like you were i don't know how it worked like that was just how it you know, I came to know you, and it was a scene, the mo the, the actual episode where you were guarding the car. Right. And okay. Someone... So yeah. So this you have to go back a fair way. Yeah. I was on the on season one of Gap Year, and yeah. then they canned me and said, "Okay, you can just work behind the scenes now. You're not good enough to yeah. be on television." And in that episode, they Hamish had bought this um, three wheeled like motorbike slash police car that can go up on sidewalks. <laughs> And so I, they, they tasked me of like, you got to look after this vehicle for us. Um, as a joke, you're like, you'll be the security guard of it. And then what I didn't realize was a further joke was they hired two guys to come and steal it off me when it felt like the TV show had already ended for the night. So these guys came and they were actually pretty good at like, they were just actors, but you know, one guy was pretending to hold a knife under his jumper and he said, do, he told me do the right thing. <laughs> I'll never forget that. He's like, do the right thing. Like you'll get stabbed if you don't give this to me. But you know, what's funny about that episode is that is the night I met my wife, current wife after that event. Wow. Yeah. So, so but you, is your wife Australian? She's American. No, American. Well, yeah. So she, I met her in New York. She was in the audience of the Gap Year TV show that night and I met her in the green room and it, like 20 minutes after that thing, that's that prank where the guys were trying to steal the car off me. So I came into the green room and I guess cause like, cause I didn't let them steal the car yeah. and everyone thought I would just like buckle over, but I didn't let them steal the car. So I got in the green room and everyone was like, I kind of was like a little bit of a hero for the <laughs> night only. Like this guy that no one really cared about on the show, but you know, people were like, yeah, you didn't let them steal the car. And so I think I came in probably with this glow to her of like, hey, this guy's really important. Of course, yeah. obviously getting a lot of attention, but it was just perfect timing. 
that's unbelievable. So that's that's a very um, fortuitous. Mm. That's my new favorite word that I use <laughs> at the moment. I really like that. That's that's incredible though. That that that, that happened at that exact time, um, and I was watching as well. So it's sort of like a triangle. Yeah, no, effect you, in I that. can't we're believe here. you weren't at the wedding. We're here today. <laughs> <laughs> Could have been. That was the first time I sort of come across you and knew you were there. But like, you were always just a staple, a part of that. Like, how did you get involved in radio how did you get involved with hamish and andy how did the whole thing transpire because from my yeah. like experience it's like you've always just sort of been a part of it yeah it was my start. first real proper job is working for hamish and, and how andy. old were you because you were Twi- every kid's like that was what every yeah kid, yeah. yeah i was 20 when i started so i did, before that i'd done community radio when i was 15 and at high school i did uh sin fm which is the student news network people in melbourne might know it it's community run outside of RMIT University and I just did a show you know on Friday afternoons with my mate from high school and so I'd done a little bit of radio and then after high school I tried to do a film and tv course and I realized I was shit at that so <laughs> as I was coming literally the last week of that film course I was like all right what am I going to do after this I don't really want to make corporate videos uh, I'll probably have to go back to radio the only other thing I know how to do so then I started doing work experience like I put my hand up to do work experience and I went over to Adelaide to work on their equivalent of what Fox FM you'd know as Fox FM in Melbourne mm. but they've, they had one in Adelaide called SAFM and I started doing work experience there and the guy said hey we can give you a job here but we can give you a similar job back in Melbourne if you want to go back to Fox so three weeks later I came back to Fox and my shift would start as Hamish and Andy were finishing each day. So I'd see them each day as they finished the show. And then I'd try and just hang around and like get there early and put my hand up like, oh, you need anyone to help out? Can I come and sit in the meetings, the planning meetings? So I was essentially a pest. Yeah. Just pestered it for about a year until I... There was never even actually an official like you're on the show now. I just hung around enough. To, like, <laughs> well, I guess that guy works here because he's here with us every day and he sits in our meetings. And and then I got my like the first time I was actually on air with them. I was pushing the buttons, which is like in a radio studio. The button pusher is the only other person in the studio with Hamish and Andy. And their guy was going on holidays for two weeks, so I got to fill in there for two weeks and they brought me on air a couple of times and I, I just got lucky like that like I just honestly was just like hanging around like a bad smell until I was working on the show full time it, I, I love this and it's got it's got um, similarities like I was chatting with Howie uh, Mark Howard about mm. this early and I think I don't agree when you say lucky because I think you've obviously put in a lot of time and a lot of effort where a lot of people wouldn't do that and a lot of people wouldn't show the initiative to like hang around and, and have interest and, and do things unpaid. Yeah. Like that, and I suppose looking back at my career now in terms of like when I was working at 3W, it really does show, and I don't think a lot of the general public know how hard it is to actually get into media, like mm. into, especially radio. Like you really have to do a massive apprenticeship and and be very, uh, you know, put yourself out there in situations where a lot of people wouldn't. Yeah. Well, because everybody thinks it's, it seems so easy. It's like, you know, you just go on... T- you like you go and talk mm. we can all do that yeah. it, being on radio is easy but i listened to that howie interview you did with him and yeah there was a lot of similarities like you just got to hang around do stuff for free um not expect anything and you'll just be eventually will come around to they need somebody to fill a hole that's available and because you've been hanging around you're most likely to get that spot so yeah it is a little bit of luck because those opportunities have got to come up and but you, yeah, you've got to be the one that's there in people's faces, essentially, so that they choose you when it does come around. Those times, like when you, you first got involved um, with, with Hamish and Andy, like back at the start. So mm. when, when was this around? What, how, how, so that, uh, 2000 and the end of 2007, I went to Adelaide. And then the start of 2008, I was um, working at Fox. And by the end of 2008, I'd been on the show a bunch of times and yep. started sitting in their meetings and that sort of thing and but at that stage that, that still wasn't at the peak of their pet like that was still pretty early on in no but they success. were already like yeah that's right like they were pretty well known on radio then and they were starting to pop up on things like spicks and specs on the abc and a couple of years after that or maybe the next year was thank god you're here so they started to become 
really well known on TV. And of mm-hmm. course, then they were doing Rove every week as well. Um, so yeah, I think I jumped on the bandwagon like just as they were nearing the peak. Yeah. I don't want to say like, oh, they were nothing. And then when I <laughs> yeah. got there, something in the water changed <laughs> and they became super famous. How has that been, I suppose, you and like, there's so many other facets to yourself than Hamish and Andy, but I suppose it was a platform for you to grow mm. and, and I suppose express some of your personality on air and, it, and it's given you a really good platform to build off into the next phase of your career with your own podcast, Christian O'Connell and, yep. and everything like that. Did you think at the time, I'm on something here that is special? Or was it more just like, I'm yeah, just I think I think so because because I had that feeling in me like, oh well, eventually I want to go off and do my own thing, but because it was such a rare place to be on, like, and I already was a fan of the show, mm. and Hamish and Andy are such great guys in real life to work with, and they became real friends, and it it just seemed crazy every year as I'd get to the end of it to go like, well, I don't want to really give this away. So I feel like in some ways I look back and go like, oh, did I stunt my own career because I hung around in there for so long and, um, you know, stopped myself from having other opportunities or would I have like jumped off too early and then just faded away into obscurity um, if I didn't have it? So I guess you never know. But for a long time, I was I was thinking that I would do my own stuff and it took a long time, like honestly, a I was with those guys for almost 10 years before I got the opportunity with Christian O'Connell mm. and the show I'm on now on Gold, um, which really felt like a big step for me. But it's not like I was doing a whole lot of work uh, outside of Hamish and Andy for those first eight years. It's, it's actually a really interesting point. I, I could be totally not on the same page as you are here, but I'm thinking about it in my context. And mm. I think like with career and, and always thinking like, I could be doing something else, but maybe you are in the right thing at the right time. Is when I left like Giants and footy, mm. I didn't leave, like it would have been very hard to leave that off my own terms. Yeah. But I like got forced to leave it. Yeah. So like, I think that's like a really hard thing for people, you know, when people say like, oh, if you don't enjoy doing something, I'm not saying that you didn't enjoy doing something, which you love, but I'm saying in terms of the whole holistic view, it's like, if you don't enjoy doing something, you can change and do something mm. different. But to make that change when something's still pretty good, and do something different is like almost impossible i feel yeah it's really hard because you get when you actually face with that moment of choice to go all right you got to 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 go into something else you have to leave the first thing you you actually have to face the reality of what that would be and it's and it's tough to leave and that's why i haven't left i still work on the hamish and andy podcast even though we're not doing daily radio i'm still tied down by it so i know but no, I tied I, down is the wrong word no i'm <laughs> 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 yeah. no, still very much enjoying my time with them but it'll be next year will be 15 years 15? That I've, that's I've crazy with them. Yeah. but it's so hard to change a winning formula as well and i think like as as much as hamish and andy are probably the best probably when i say probably like definitely the probably the best definitely probably mm. the best duo of all time really like when you think about what they've been able to do um it is incredible but you are a staple in that as well. And, and, you know, I'm sure they would say this, maybe not publicly, but there is no mm. Hamish Andy without Jack, if you are a true fan of the show. No, I definitely haven't heard them say it publicly. I'm <laughs> 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 pointing at that is like, when I say Hamish and Andy are so, are so good, I know people would get this, but I think they've done something that's incredible, mm. but I also think they've fucked it for everyone in a way because <laughs> they've made it look so easy that yeah. every dickhead, including myself, thinks that they can do it as yeah, well. It's like, yeah, like, definitely. Like every two mates out there that go, we're so funny, let's start a podcast, yeah. which I'm the biggest victim of that as well. Like they've just made every kid in the world think, I could be Hamish and Andy. Yeah, but I kind of like that. And we did see it a lot. Like people would email all the time or just stop you on the street and be like, oh, no way. You'd never believe I'm like Hamish and my best mate's like Andy. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> um I reckon it goes back to that thing that Howie was talking about and what we were talking about earlier is like, you probably don't realize how much of that success is the hard work that they put in behind the yeah. scenes. And those guys work so hard, really, really hard to make like anything they're doing, the radio, the TV show. It's not just like rock up and piss around, which probably is the image that they give to people is like, oh, you just take your best mate in front of a couple of microphones and you piss around and it's it's really awesome. But they really work hard and I learned a lot of my work ethic off how hard they those guys work. That That's an incredible point and I, I, I don't know if we can uh, spoil in their secrets. I don't think mm. it is because I think it is common knowledge how hard they work mm. on their projects. But 
uh, you, you all do make it look pretty seamless. Mm. And I think, you know, in the show, um, you've got your characteristics of this, like... Uh, thrifty guy that's yep. that's lazy yeah and hamish is the you know the funny <laughs> yeah. guy andy's the like anxious guy whatever yeah. it is like you've got these personalities yeah how much of that is actually your personalities but then again it's more like you you can play yeah. up to these things and you fall into them yeah. and you actually work together on them so this is <laughs> this is pointless to say because as much as you fight against it you can never <laughs> yeah. um, you can never prove it i am not thrifty in real life i actually feel like i'm quite generous <laughs> and that i am <laughs> And that I am <laughs> kind with money. But if you ever try to push back against something like that, then the others just push down harder on it. Yeah. So there's no point in fighting it. The best you can do is lean into it. I would like to say though, for everybody listening here, I feel like I'm a generous person. It, <laughs> just well, we as generous kind of, as You came in, we just met you and you were like, can I show you guys some beers? I was like, it's 10 a in the morning. <laughs> I don't want that right now, but I really appreciate it. All right, we'll just take the money and then buy the beers yourselves <laughs> later, please. I'd love for you to enjoy it. <laughs> but it oh. is true. It's like, it, it happens, it all happens naturally. It's not like you sit down and go like, all right, let's plot out the characters on the show. But it's you know you, you show one glimpse of a personality trait and the and the rest of the um group exploits it and i mean it happens with like hamish being lazy and late all the time it happens with andy being really anal about things yeah. um but yeah there's nothing you can really do once <laughs> once especially the listeners have grabbed hold of it as well <laughs> and it's just like folklore of the show there's very little you can do to get away from it looking now as you said you're coming up on 15 years being involved what's a highlight for you in whether that's a trip away um impact on people what's something you look back now and think fuck that was probably one of the coolest things i've done in terms of the hamish and andy side of, of yeah we, well with hamish and andy easily is the uh the band we made so for people who don't know we each sort of play instruments. Yep. I, I play guitar and Hamish plays drums, not very well. <laughs> and Andy is a bit of a multi-instrumentalist, so he can play a few things. And we made a band that only plays one cover song per gig. So we didn't have to learn a whole back catalogue of songs. Yeah. We are just like, all right, on this on this tour that we're doing, we only have to learn one song. So for example, one of them was ACDC, Long Way to the Top. Good and song. then we and then we toured it up the country. <laughs> and the reason I love that is because for a while, like in high school, I thought Rockstar was going to be my vocation. I thought I would, you know, I played in a band and I thought, all right, I'm going to be a rock star one day. And that never came around. So this is the closest I'll ever get to being a rock star is pretending to be in a rock band and pretending that the people who are there to watch us really love us for our musical abilities what, what was the name that there was oh we were called front man and cool cool boys in the front man yeah that is fair <laughs> so we had we didn't have a singer in the band we had a rotating singer yeah so every it was time. like yeah like rob thomas rob thomas was the first one yeah um we had guy sebastian the veronicas the wiggles um we did every show we'd do someone different vance joy was the last person we'd oh, played yeah. with live but the other reason i like that is because it started from an idea that i pitched so the rob thomas thing happened because actually a few weeks before rob thomas came in adam lambert who's from american idol yes and sung with queen yes was coming in and i said we should play with him because he said oh i'm not bringing any instruments so i'm not going to play live i said well we all sort of play instruments we could play live with him he said no to that but then the, <laughs> the idea stayed on the whiteboard yeah. and then eventually rob thomas said all right i'll i'll do it and the band was born from that so i feel like i feel honored by it because it came from a seed of something that i offered up to the show what what other ideas have you ever had on the show that you've put on the whiteboard that you're still waiting to have yep. been picked off now no, oh, not to be picked off i also the the most viral clip that hamish and andy have ever come up with was um world's best bloke uh, Australia's best bloke, I think. Oh, is the name I know of it. him. Oh, I do played Jim Lord, Jimmy Lord. <laughs> I don't know him. James Lord. So he right. was a, like, I played footy with him. Oh right, it was okay. unbelievable. So for people who don't know, it's this prank that was like a friendly prank because the joke's not on anybody. Hamish calls him and said, "I'm calling you out of the blue. Some, I need a reference for a job. I'm giving them your number. Can you just be a great reference for me?" And then <laughs> goes away. Ten minutes later, Andy calls up this guy who, you know, he doesn't know it's Hamish and Andy. And says, "Hey, I've interviewed this guy Tim for a job." He it was says, a treasurer of a football club, wasn't it? Oh no, oh, that I was can't even, I, can't yeah. re I honestly can't remember it. And then um, it was, yeah, it, they asked this guy, like, "Oh, can you vouch for 
um, Tim, this guy who's come in for an interview, and the guy did way better than we could ever expect. It was the funniest thing I've ever heard. He was so good. He was like, mate, this is the best guy. He tells me like... Uh, he he won't be forthcoming about this, but he speaks many languages. Yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> and they go, is he is he good with money? And he yeah. says, oh well, he's a treasurer of the football club, so he, he's been trusted. Yeah. yeah. So that is, I think that's the most viewed Hamish and Andy thing all around the world, and I had a hand in bringing that yeah, about. Did. I like, I mean, that. I don't want to say it was all my. It was. I think I think like when you're in a team, you pitch ideas and like sort of make yeah. ideas together. But that no, was you. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> you know that again. I I really like this clip, and it's because it was yours. I know the idea was incredible. But after that, I remember um, you actually got him into the studio, and you, the right. air, you went off air. And I think you four were sitting in there and said, "Oh, let's have a beer to celebrate." And then you opened the esky, and there was only three beers in there, and you guys were all looking at each other, and I and he about goes. That. Oh, you guys have him, yeah. and then you're like, he's the best bloke yeah. in the world. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We set up another scenario yeah. for him, and we're like, was when it finished, and yeah. he's just like, oh, you got, you guys have him. So, do you, you still know him? I know him. Oh, yeah. What a legend. yeah, I haven't seen him for years, but he yeah. he really is a good bloke. Does he still dine out on that story of like? I'm I don't the best know. I should. I really should make contact yeah. on that. But um, and then all right, I'll give you one idea because you asked for ideas that didn't make it off the whiteboard. Yeah, <laughs> this is an idea that I pitched both Hamish and Andy and Christian O'Connell, and they didn't want it. So if you want it, you can have the idea. You need to have callers though. We can do call. We do yeah. calls on our other show. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's called Three Fingers or Four. What it is is I say a cartoon character, and some cartoon characters have three fingers, some have four fingers. <laughs> so I say like Bart Simpson. How many fingers does he have? Four. Wait, yeah, it's a bit confusing because you've got three and a thumb. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think that was that confusion is what stopped it ever going to air. But um, yeah, you can have that. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have mentally put a really good note yeah. on that. And Guys, I'll, write it down. Can yeah, write down yeah, yeah well, we're going to write it down. Um, in terms of traveling, like we spoke before about like going to the US, everywhere you've been. Where's some of your favourite trips that you've had um, as a team that you've just enjoyed the most? Yeah, definitely that New York gap year, which was the first one um, that we did and where I met my wife. Like, that was awesome because now it's changed my whole life. Mm. Like, if I didn't meet her, obviously my life would be way different. Hey, just on that, I'm a man yeah. of love. Yeah. Do you mind? Can we talk about love? Yeah, of course. So, yeah. I, I love relationship stories. We, we don't have a few beers with people. I love just asking like how they met their partners. Yeah. Is that weird? No, no, no. Okay, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of love. Me too. Yeah. Um, do you have so a partner? I do. I'm yeah. engaged. How do you How do you guys meet? <laughs> we met. We actually met in school. So I was in year eleven. She was year twelve. So mm -hmm. sugar hey, mama, yeah, sugar mama. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, no, she had her license. She used to go pick me up from school. Mm. I think back then. <laughs> I think back then it was like before Instagram and stuff. So like, wasn't like it was like nearly MSN sort of day. Yeah. So it was like a little bit different. Um, I'd have no fucking remember idea the, how to but meet remember girls. Remember the um. The nerves of like after school getting on MSN oh. Messenger and like, all right, here we go. Here, here we, we go. go. <laughs> here we go. I've avoided eye contact with you all day, yeah. but now I'm going to chat to you I like we are best spoken friends. Spoken one word to you in person, <laughs> but here we go. I'll do my business. Um, I actually it's like you log on though. Why aren't you talking to me? I'm going to log on and log back off and just pop up again to hopefully you see me. The awkward part for me was we had the family computer in the kitchen. <laughs> so it was, it was like a lot of foot traffic behind, like my dad, my mum yeah. walking past, my brothers and sisters. So... If I wanted to be like, you know, take it up a level, yeah, I had yeah, to yeah. look over my shoulder yeah. to make sure people then weren't watching. It. Yeah. Um, I dial up. Yeah. Did you have dial up? Yeah, of yeah. course. Yeah. yeah. I had yeah. to wait till how the people got off the phone oh, so you could get nothing online. Nothing worse when mum would, you know, you'd pick up the phone and you just have this screeching noise of dial up mm. in the background. But um, it used to take me probably six minutes to download maybe like one 30 second song on LimeWire. Yeah, I downloaded, oh, I downloaded the whole of Not Another Teen Movie. Do you remember that comedy? Yeah, that would have taken it you. Took, like I, I think a it day. took like six months. Really? No, it took ages. It was like it was it was it was like a marathon. I had to keep coming back to LimeWire like every couple of days. And starting like, it again. Do that thing where you right click on it and you like give it the highest yeah, priority. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't worth How it. Good was LimeWire. <laughs> Fuck! I ruined some computers at home with LimeWire. Like really did. Um, back to your um, wife now. So when you met, did you kick it off straight? Like, were you guys seeing each other after that, or was it more like you went home and then? tick back up that's yeah. just one thing so that first night I met her in the green room there was an after party for the show and everybody went back to a bar and I thought she 
was with the guy she came with. She came with a work friend of hers and I thought I just assumed it was her boyfriend. Yeah. So I wasn't trying to hit on her or anything because I was just chatting to her naturally because I thought she was taken. Then I see that guy go home and I was like, oh, that your, your partner's left without you? She's like, oh, no, that's just a friend from work. So I was like, oh, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm the hero. <laughs> I'm I feel the like hero. the chemistry's yeah. already flowing. <laughs> Then I tried to kiss her and she pulled her head away. <laughs> <laughs> so the our first like romantic encounter was me leaning in for the kiss and her Yeah, just the limbo. The the, the limbo. <laughs> so I stuffed that up, but then I <laughs> just, I don't know how I came back from there. Like I would have been at a million to one odds to come back from that position. But I still hung around with her and chatted to her for the rest of the night and then she went well how much do you want to know the story because it's like i won't go i won't go into every facet yeah, of it but it's pg it, sort of no, yeah. oh, okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then if a man loves a woman very much <laughs> and they feel comfortable with each other <laughs> no but she let me stay over at her house that night she built a mm -hmm. pillow fort in between oh, us yeah, she said nice. you can yeah. you can stay over but i'm building this pillow fort nothing's gonna happen i don't know you i'm not that kind of person that takes people home <laughs> the first night i meet them um and i did manage to kiss her over the pillow oh, fort that's and, nice. uh, just by war of attrition and <laughs> then we started hanging out all the time so i had, I had two months left in new york before we were coming home and we spent pretty much every day together so, and yeah. we we said like all right we both know what's going to happen at the end of this it's going to be super sad but we'll leave each other for good so let's try and make the most of it now we did this thing where we celebrated every holiday throughout the year but put it all into one week so we did christmas one day and then halloween and then valentine's day thanksgiving yeah. so that we could experience all the holidays that we wouldn't get to do together and then like i no surprise like then we were totally crazy for each other mm. by the end of it but we still had to say goodbye to one another and that was honestly the most i've ever cried in my mm. life was saying goodbye to her it was um I was at Andy's place. Andy left a week before we left New York and he had this sick like $10,000 a month apartment in Soho that he made the Channel 9 pay for. <laughs> and so we were staying in this awesome apartment. It was just ridiculous. And I was in the foyer of that apartment and like we said goodbye to each other, like tears bawling down our face. And then I was back in Australia for about a week and still chatting to her and she said look why don't i come for a holiday i've been saving up to go to paris next summer why don't i come to melbourne instead and then once she was in melbourne i just hooked into her and then never let her go so did she stay after that, that she stayed after that yeah she tried to get home a couple of times especially her mum and dad tried to get her yeah. home like they were not happy about it and we then then hamish and Andy went on another gap year in london the next year for the 2012 Olympics and she came to that and the idea she had in her head I didn't know this at the time she was like all right and then I'll go back to live in the US after this is all done why well, I, I thought like by this time we'd been together almost a year so I was like oh sweet this is you know she's the one and uh her mom she her folks live in Florida she went back to Florida and her mum and her auntie were really trying to like convince her to stay oh, her on. dad she loves books and publishing and her dad got her an interview with like the head of random house which is a huge book publisher in new york the it's, hell, in, like, dad? Yeah, it's <laughs> in like we'll do anything for you to stay and she decided to come back to melbourne and so oh, we man. like love prevailed and as a love fan i'm sure you i can i do get appreciate that i do get tingles thinking about the story but no it is it is awesome i think um, anyone long distance relationships I haven't had one personally but my best mate had had one mm. and I know how hard they can be on, on relationships and yeah. it's I don't think we would have lasted like if, it, if we tried to do long distance mm. we didn't even ch chat about it like trying to do a year away from each other but yeah I, I don't know that would be really tough very tough um, moving on from love I did enjoy mm. that but after I suppose like my timelines and stuff are never great mm. but you've Started with Christian O'Connell, so that was start of this year. No, no, we've been doing that since 2018. 
Christian Oak, but yeah, the branding. We were talking about the branding earlier. Man, like, that was three years ago you saw no, that. No, it yeah, was yeah, not. Dude, it was, yeah. So I've we been in Sydney for two years. Oh, right. Okay, so maybe you've just seen more recent billboards and stuff. But yeah, he, he came he came in 2018. He's he's a UK DJ and was like a legendary d- DJ over there. So give us context on this because we'll chat mm. about this before, but Christian O'Connell basically, and he's got an incredible story himself. Mm. We'll chat about this before. He had, did a podcast with Hugh Van Kallenberg. Yeah. Unbelievable story. But he was basically, and still is, but he was one of the biggest radio personalities in the UK. Yeah, he did. He had like 2 million listeners a morning across the UK. All these awards, always number one. And he just needed something different in his life because, you, you know, he was getting, um, I guess, just fatigued by like the same thing every mm. day. And so he came out to Australia. He knew Hamish and Andy already because we'd been, when we did the um, 2012 gap year for the Olympics, we yeah, met him then. Yeah. And so did some simulcast shows with him. So he said to Andy, like, hey, would, would it be crazy if I came to uh australia to do radio and he said no i think it's a great idea and it was actually andy who recommended me to be the sidekick on christian show which i do now because christian was like well i need somebody else in the studio with me can you recommend anybody so i've andy hamish and andy to thank for that as well for for the current gig i've got yeah he's a total pro i can't speak highly enough of him i've learned so much from him um if people are in Melbourne and then their breakfast show is not on Gold 104.3, make the change now because it's yourself. a great show. With that as well, just in terms of like his show, we are talking about this earlier, but there is a lot of similarities with radio shows in, in Melbourne, mm-hmm. um, especially breakfast radio. What do you think separates Christian O'Connor? You said before, it's like, it is a... He- well, I like I like that, and they, this isn't completely unknown in Australian radio, but for a long time, breakfast shows here have been like one girl one guy or one girl two guys like in melbourne it was um fifi fev and dave and fifi fev and uh jules and uh, you know a few other ones and then chrissy sam and brownie and all the breakfast shows sort of sounded like each other there wasn't a lot of difference so christian show really stood out because it's like it's him it's only him on the posters it's called the christian o'connell show he's the captain of the team even though there's other voices like me and the newsreader on the show it's really his ship and Mm. he's he's in charge of it so i think it really stood out on breakfast radio um in melbourne and like we're number one fm now and so he came from people not knowing him at all to the number one uh, breakfast show in the city at the moment how many um, do you have tuning in do you know those with the ratings and stuff like how many people tuning in oh man I never <laughs> every day it's a, they call it survey day Surveys, where the right results yeah. come out they come out like every eight weeks I never know what day is survey day yeah. everybody else seems to know and, I, and it makes me anxious thinking about it oh I, I, I just never like it doesn't I it doesn't, it doesn't phase me I just yeah. don't care really like as long as the show's allowed to continue on um I just never got that excited about what the stats are. I don't. I it's don't just know interesting how many to think, listen. like when you, you know, obviously podcasting is a lot different to radio, but it's it's crazy for me to think you, when you are doing breakfast radio, you are talking to millions of people. Like that's probably the fact I was thinking. Like it, there's so many people listening to. Yeah, you but, it, but it's like talking to you now. Like you don't. We we don't have this conversation that. thinking about yeah. all the people who could be listening to it, and it's the same thing. And that's what is hard about radio, but it seems so easy it's like mm. and when you get to the sweet spot is just completely being yourself and not trying to be a broadcaster and not having the mental image of all those people in your mind it's just getting to a point where it does sound like you're having a natural conversation with somebody else what is your goals with with radio media career now um as you said you're working with uh hamish and andy one day a week on their podcast mm. you're still killing it They're, they can't do much wrong um, Krishna O'Connell obviously you said number one breakfast show uh, on FM at the moment what's your goals like do you yeah. know what your next thing is is there anything in the in the works You've yeah well podcast? I just I just signed another four years with Christian show only last month so I'm, oh, I'm yeah I'm in it for the long haul now Holy shit, and that's... that'll take us to seven years at the end of it I signed two years with Hamish and Andy so it's like that's unbelievable they'll, they'll take me to 15 years uh, yeah so I'm just sitting pretty at the moment I'm um, yeah, but my wife and I, we hopefully start a family soon. Yeah. So, I don't know, just like put my feet up and take it easy. What are the... <laughs> <laughs> 40, like that's um, from someone that like I 
in my career it's always sort of like a year to year thing mm. do you like I, you I always think especially because i guess now that i'm i'm 33 now mm. and you never think about it when you're young but at in over the last three years i can't stop comparing my age to like if i played afl they'd be pushing me out yeah. right now. Yeah. <laughs> like, no matter how much I wanted to be good, like just naturally my body would say, no, you can't play yeah. anymore. Yeah. So I'm very thankful that I'm in a career by accident that uh, is not ageist like that. You're because not- it, like in radio, you can go, even if I wind up on 3AW or somewhere like Talkback Radio, I can still realistically in my 70s be doing the same thing if I want mm. to be doing radio and you convert into like a different person as well mm. I suppose like you've got like the things that I'm talking about now or you know two years ago are different to things you talk about when you're older and you've got more yeah that's, what it, that's what's cool about it I reckon is like you just you grow with it so as you grow up and things about you change the things you talk about change but you don't have to be the person you were at 20 when you first started doing radio to be the to be a broadcaster into your 30s and 40s and 50s even just thinking now a lot of the content you've done and you know like stuff that i've done earlier you listen back and then you go fuck that's actually on record now like not that they're bad thoughts but like you can actually like track your progression through the whole time you know what i think helps is like the more stuff you make the more it just becomes part of like the noise of yeah. your history. Like, <laughs> yeah. If you'd only done two podcasts yeah. and like you stuffed up or said something really horrible in one, then we'd all be able to find it easily. Like you're up to like 100 plus episodes yeah. now. It's just all harder. part of like the yeah. junk. And who's going to take the time to like, oh, oh I'm, I, I remember not. Dylan said something like, <laughs> I really can't controversial. Find I want to cancel him, but who's got the time? Yeah, <laughs> people, yeah, let's, I hope no one has the time for that. That would really suck. Um, hey, speaking of podcasts, Jackie Road Studios. Mm-hmm. Um, that's your podcast yeah doing incredible things um how much are you taking this like is it just a part of your stride now you're still performing what's the goals with with that yeah so we're on a hiatus at the moment yeah. over at jackie road studios yeah. and we i wish i had a team man you got a cool team here it's cool that you yeah, got like maybe you're welcome here like anytime. people behind laptops and like <laughs> The guy behind the camera is honestly on his phone and just playing like Tetris yeah. or something, but, <laughs> but he's here. <laughs> he's here. Yeah. I just hide them for the day to so just make it sound but more But Jackie fresh, Road was a production that I was trying to do all on my own. It was just like, um, I needed a break from it. So it's on a hiatus at the moment, but the first season I'm so happy with. Like for, for people who don't know it, the idea was I would chat to a guest and then at the end of the episode, I would take something that we talked about and turn it into a song. Mm. And it was also a way to learn how to become a better recorder and like record the songs. So I'm doing it all in my second bedroom, like record the guitar, record the vocals. And then this guy who was a fan of the show was doing drums for it. So it was a really cool project, um, but I had to, I had to put it on pause. And now every time I think about bringing it back, I just think of all the work, like the heavy workload yeah. that it is. And I, and I have no intention to bring it back really soon, but I, I'm very proud of it. Who are some of your favourite guests um, you've had on? I listened to uh, a couple the other day, the Amy Shark one with, obviously you forgot to record that. Yeah, yeah. It was a, a big one. but that, that, was a, that was a big one because the, the, the other thing is all the guests I had pretty much were people I knew, um, except Amy was the only one that I reached out to Sony and said, hey, I'd love to interview Amy oh, Shark. No. I know she's got an album coming out, so I thought that she might be interested in it. And I record, did the whole interview with her, like we're doing now. And then at the end of it, literally as I'm saying goodbye to her. There's I, vision of this. Yeah, I, I look down yeah. at my computer to like press pause and there's nothing to pause. <laughs> there's nothing to pause. And I said, even no, it's even worse than that. My, I recorded my side of the conversation and she was on the she was in sydney i was in melbourne and i just didn't record any of her i just didn't record her it's at got all you talking so it's now. just got me talking it's like all right here's a podcast of my questions for amy shark <laughs> use her silence to in, you know, like <laughs> in your imagination to see what she answered luckily i was a, i was able to sort of salvage it she was filming at her end because i asked her to film it so we can make videos yep. so i got her laptop audio of the video and was able to like squish it back together which thank god because i there's no worse feeling for somebody in this industry than like 
going to do a big interview or what you think is a big interview putting all that that nervous energy you get pre-interview into it writing all your questions and then completely stuffing it up and not having anything to show for it at so the it end it makes me anxious thinking about it because it, it really is the worst thing you can do my very first day on radio when i did that work experience gig in adelaide i rocked up into the studio and they introduced me to the breakfast team there's this team called rabbit amber and louie in adelaide and amber had flown to sydney to interview jerry seinfeld was the only person in adelaide that got the opportunity to speak to jerry seinfeld and one of the microphones wasn't working and like the situation with me and amy shark is you got amber's questions and then off really off mic was like jerry going like yeah well the thing about <laughs> <laughs> and that was my first day in commercial radio. I was like, oh, it's not so different to the community radio that I came from where we stuff up all the time. <laughs> Fucking hell, that is... Yeah, I, I can't imagine... Well, I have been in that situation a lot and it is the most awkward thing in the yeah. world. It's, it's even worse when... You probably would have felt worse for her because she's hating you as well. Exactly, and they've given you their time. Like, they don't really have oh. to do it. Truth is, she's not selling more albums because she came on yeah. my podcast. Like... She's, she's kind of doing you a favour and you feel awful that you put them through that. It's not your only podcast mm. you've been a part of. Mm. Um, you're also a big Essendon man. You love your footy. Yes. So where's the, where's the love of the Dons come from? All right. So <laughs> Essendon, oh, how I became an Essendon fan is easy. I was five years old at the most impressionable age. They won the 93 grand final. 93. So I chose them as my team. I wanted to do, I had a short lived podcast with the Essendon Football Club that if people don't know, I don't blame them because it was four episodes <laughs> in 2017. It's, Can we still find it? You, I uh, wonder if you could find it. Good question. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, no, the podcast itself is really good. I'm not embarrassed by it. <laughs> I'll, I'll see if we can dig it up. It was called Hard Tag and it was me, Tom Bell Chambers and Kale Hooker. And I approached the footy club and I didn't want any payment for it or anything. I just wanted to... Um, like be involved with the club and I, was, I thought well what can I bring as skills and I was like well I can make a podcast with them if you guys are interested in making a podcast I'd love to do it with another player and they came to me and said look Tom and Kale are great friends they want to do it together I was like great three of us on the podcast and every week we have a rotating member of the team come through so we had Zarakis, Joe Watson we had Andy McGrath who was just the number one draft pick and the episodes were great and then we didn't start that until the end of the 2017 season. And so we didn't make finals and we're like, all right, well, let's pick this up hopefully next year. And then I completely stuffed it. And there's a lesson <laughs> to be learned here for me. <laughs> if, if I think back to why I started it, like I just wanted to be involved with the club. Like yeah. I don't care about getting paid or whatever, but I, at the end of 2017, <laughs> <laughs> I, hate, I hate thinking about this, this and I've never talked about this. This contract negotiations. Yeah. <laughs> I approached like a talent manager and oh. said to her, can you help me just do this deal with the Essendon Football Club about a podcast? And then she, and I thought she was the pro, right? Yeah. <laughs> she was like, well, I've worked with like branded podcasts already and you can ask for like, Ten to fifteen thousand dollars per episode. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "Whoa, that's that's high." Yeah. She's like, "Yeah, like that's that, like that's, that's where the that's, that's, that's where that's the market standard. that's where the market's at for these branded podcasts." Maybe she's I don't know what branded podcast she's talking about. Like maybe Nike made a podcast yeah. with LeBron James <laughs> yeah. or something. Anyway, she's like, "We can get ten to fifteen thousand dollars." I was like, "Well, even." Ten thousand dollars, I'm sure, will be <laughs> nine thousand <000. laughs> like dollars a week. I, I think we'd be happy with that. Yeah. Give some to Tom, give some to Kale. We'll be able to play the pay the player. So I go into the Essendon Football Club with uh, this manager and the like three people from the Essendon Football Club, like the social media guy and two other marketing people. And the look on their face when we said we want ten thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars per episode to make a podcast, where essentially they're supplying the players to me, and I don't know what I could possibly bring. It's going to be at the end of the season twenty two hundred twenty thousand dollars worth of value yeah. to them. 
So they said no, <laughs> <laughs> respectfully. <laughs> they said we'll, we'll decline, <laughs> even though we love what you did last year for free. Um, we don't see the markup of $10,000 per episode <laughs> as worth it for us. Oh. So then after that meeting, I wanted to backtrack really quickly, but I'd already told Tom and Kale like, hey, payday's coming for us. <laughs> <laughs> and then they were like oh this is great because then the players we get on we don't have to ask favors of them we can say there's yeah. some money in there for you to come on as a guest so then it was just like the the waters were muddied after that and there was there was to be no repairing of the friendship between me and the football club <laughs> so we parted ways and they've since now made their own podcast without me but it's just a, a, a real lesson learned for me about being a greedy shit, I guess. Don't, yeah. Oh, hundred percent. Has the what's the relationship like with with Kyle Hooker and, and Tom Bell? I tried now? to keep it alive for because yeah. we got on really well doing the podcast, yeah. and I tried to keep it alive for a little bit. Like I'd text him after games and be like, oh, "Great goal," <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then slowly I'd start getting like they would only ever do like thumbs up emoji yeah, back I just to like me, it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then slowly it became less and less so. And then I kept it going like the fire just burning with Kale for a little bit longer, but. I think it's probably dead now. Yeah. But they well, were great guys. I have if he's remember. listening, he if might. he's listening, um, thanks for those sh- four short weeks that we spent together. We had something <laughs> magic, and sorry, I ruined it. <laughs> this isn't your only awkward relationship with AFL players, though, is it? You've got a habit of doing this. Is yeah. this true? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, my other awkward relationship is with uh, some of the boys from the Melbourne Demons. Yeah, I met. Tom McDonald by chance he was actually a fan of Hamish and Andy podcast and came up to me at an event and Hamish is a big Melbourne supporter Hamish is a big Melbourne supporter he's friends with like Gorney and Tom McDonald now but this is like maybe three or four years ago and I started to become friends with Tom McDonald but only in like I would text him back and forth and then one day he opened up the door to me to like become their friend and he said hey on Wednesdays we've got a day off or we finish training early and a few of the boys like to go to this cafe where they have board games and we play a board game together <laughs> that is and he's like hey, do you want to come along it's because okay, I've on Christian shows where I've talked about loving board games before I'm yeah. a big board game fan <laughs> yeah. but this was my first three months doing the breakfast show with Christian show and I was having terrible sleep deprivation because I'd never woken up that early before and I was getting up, even getting up at 4.30 in the morning was taking its toll on me mm-hmm. and by the afternoons I was crashing out. Yep. So I go along to the board game cafe but I'm really like trying to just keep oh, my no. head up and like my yeah, eyes from yeah. blinking. <laughs> like, oh, oh, I can't like, I can't pull myself together here. So... <laughs> I sit down with the boys. It's Max Gorn, Jake Lever, Tom McDonald, um, this other legend called Paddy. I forget his surname. McKenna. Yeah, Paddy McKenna. He was a legend. Um, he must have been. They won't say the same. <laughs> they, they won't say the same about me. It's because, like the rest of them must have been looking at me and then like looking back at Tom. Is like, why have you bought this guy? He's like not even speaking. Yeah. <laughs> he seems so disinterested and can't even keep his eyes open. Because like, why they're going around the board playing Catan or whatever we're playing, and I'm just like trying to like focus on the game trying to focus on the conversation and, and you know that when sometimes you just a step behind everything that's being said and yes. no matter what you yeah. do you can't get a foot in there so that was me on that first day and i thought i left there and thought well there's no way yeah. i'm done, <laughs> done. Here. somehow a few weeks later tom gives me another chance and says we're going back into the board games again and i can't believe i'm getting it being given a second chance I go back again, I'm worse than the first time. Oh, like, no. <laughs> the, the, like the tiredness has caught up with me so much that I'm worse than the first time. So I'm doing like the nod offs. I'm not even talking to anybody. I ask for a, like, I can tell that the writing's on the wall. So all I remember is asking for a photo with them at the oh, end. No. <laughs> so it's like, it was honestly you like, you admitting gonna see like ever again. All right, I'm out of here. Can I just prove to my friends that we were for a short period, <laughs> but we were all friends. But I hate to think of that first impression I left on them. And I even now when I see Gorney on TV or like I listen to him on, during your podcast and I just think like, what must he think of, of me? Thought. And uh, I feel sorry mostly for Tom because he was the one who stuck his neck out and tried to bring a new friend into the arena who was just a complete idiot and a nonce. Do you, do you find that though? Like even 
when you know Tom's bringing you there, he's like he would be flexing himself, being like, "I know Jack Pose. Like he's going to come here and be funny. You know, he's a real funny guy. He's on Hamish and Andy. Like <laughs> I hope you would... didn't say yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you find pressure in Watch that? Watch out, like... guys! You are get get ready to laugh. Get ready to laugh. He'll be here any second. I really hope. You didn't <laughs> Do you say find that. that though when people when you meet people like? Is it like, I know you're not a comedian per se, you've done mm. some stand-up, mm. but do people expect something from you because they've heard you, they know, they think you're, they're, you're mm. they're like subconsciously mates with you already? Nah, I don't, I think because like, if you've listened to the show, I'm not like known for my witty repertoire. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm kind of like... The dryness. I'm just like a bit bumbly yeah. like, all over the place. <laughs> so I don't think people expect me to be funny and I don't feel like definitely like when I'm meeting people out, like holding court and doing all these jokes and maybe making people no, wet well, their pants. You've done it today. We're, we're laughing. <laughs> oh, thank it's been you, funny. No, you've been very funny and taller than I thought. <laughs> um, mate, last thing I want to ask you, and I think this is a, a massive question because we have so many people listen that always love their career. They want to get further in their career. Mm. You've done it. You've been a massive inspiration for me. I'm not just saying that now, like just the way you've, you've worked and hustled and got to where you are now. It's been incredible and, and a credit to yourself. You should be extremely Thank proud. You, man. I think, and a credit to you for what you do here as well, because it's, um, it's way easier than it looks and nobody ever thinks about the interviewer, but having been the interviewer in the past, I know it's a tough job. Yeah. And I think what you do so well that like you never get this with journalists asking people questions and you get it very rarely even with professional broadcasters is you allow yourself to be vulnerable with people and it makes them feel really comfortable about being vulnerable themselves so straight away you're having these real conversations with people that you've never heard and i loved when you talk like when you're talking to max gorn and he's able to be vulnerable because you are and alex rance and even with howie and and i'm looking forward to going back through the back catalogue mm. of Dylan Friends to hear more of it. Thank you, thank you. Um, the question in that, and you just have compliments. I, I, I don't do well with compliments. I have no idea what to say, but I really appreciate it. Well, that's it. how I felt when you said I was tall. Okay, well, don't. Well, don't there's well, don't a rule on this I'm show tall. is don't. You can't double up on my compliment. If I'm complimenting oh. you, just take it, and okay, then I'll take okay, okay. it. But, like, just don't cut my compliments off. Okay, okay so no, I'm trying no, to say. Beg your pardon. Um, what advice would you give to someone at Jack Post at 20 years of age mm. to get to where you are now, what would you say is in your industry is the most important thing that you've learned through that time? Yeah, harping on what we said earlier, do the, do the jobs that you don't want to do. You're never going to walk into a radio station or like a TV set or whatever it is and just be the person who's on air. Like you got to go through that thing of doing all the jobs. And I did all of them at radio stations. I did all of them. Like my first thing was cutting up podcasts for Hamish and Andy and uploading them. Um, I would do pro audio production. I would answer phones. I would stay in panel shows, which is like, um, you know, pushing the buttons for shows that were Very coming from, from Sydney um, overnight. Like I just tried to do everything in the arena, always try and do my best job that I can at it always try and be available and not expect anything in return. I did a lot of working for free. I'm not saying that this is the right way to do it and this is the right thing for, for businesses to exploit people and make them work for free, but it works because if you're that person who's always putting yourself out there, eventually an opportunity is gonna make way and you can grab it with both hands and you'll be ready to do it because you've, you've got skills in so many areas. And I think that's, I, I like being a broadcaster who's gone through that um, journey because it means I know a lot of what the people on the show are doing. I know what it's mm. like to be a producer. I know what it's like to answer phones. I still on Christian O'Connell show answer phones during the songs and the ads. Um, so my advice would be just get your hands on as many opportunities as you can. And it's hard. It's, it's easier said than done because you've got to still get your foot in the door to get those opportunities. But once you do, work hard, make yourself known, put your hand up for anything, learn more try and upskill in all the places that you can and eventually things will start opening up for you yeah absolutely agree mm. you're, you're a real doer i yeah. like that yeah uh, and then i and then also in this day and age like what you're doing make make a podcast like if you really want to be on air and get skills make a podcast and don't worry about how many people are listening to it no. if you think people won't listen to it just the experience you'll get making it getting flying hours talking into a microphone it it will it'll do you wonders for your progress, even if you think 
people won't listen to it. And for people who say everybody's got a podcast, it's so cliche to have a podcast. Screw that. I, Just, I if you want to make one, fucking make one. And you think that that people, when people say that, they you know people. And again, I, I like it when people say this to me. They're like, oh, what's next for you, man? You know, podcasting can only last for so long. And I'm like, well, if you look at America, like they're fucking twenty years into this. We're yeah. like ten years behind still. So I don't think it's going anywhere. Yeah. Um, and, and what's the rule to say there should be an X number of podcasts? No, like, I, I, the more it, podcasts, the better. The more, yeah. like, it's it's like when people think people only listen to one radio station yeah. or one podcast. Like, yeah. the more podcasts is actually better. Um, and I should say as well, when you said about the back catalogue stuff and something that I know you'd be massive on and, and similar to I, like, you just got to start something. Yeah. Because don't go too far back into my back catalogue. Yeah. But, <laughs> like, please, like, because yeah. it, it's fucking terrible. But that... Nearly every day I go, fuck, I should, I should delete my first 10. But then I'm like, I saw this thing the other day and I was like, well, if you're not embarrassed about your early work, mm. you started too late. Yeah, that's so a great point. It's like, you, you probably started at a stage where you should have started two years earlier. Yep. So I think it's nearly take credit in starting something when you're not experienced yeah. in it. Because and it's, I've, I've suffered from that. I, I totally agree. And I say, don't, if you're thinking of starting, using podcasting as an example again, you don't have to wait till you like, oh, wait till I have all the great equipment mm. that Joe Rogan has or I'll like, oh, wait till I booked in three guests. Just start, start. like yeah. however you can. If you're recording into your laptop microphone, just start and you'll get and you'll learn and you'll get better as you go. It doesn't all have to be perfect at the start. And I, and I suffered from that in the past. I definitely when I've like you mentioned that I've done stand up before. I was so worried about doing that show at the Melbourne Comedy Festival that it almost I almost stopped myself from doing it just because I was like, I don't want anybody, I never want to bomb. Like I, you hear comedians always talking about like in their early days, they bombed on stage. I was like, I don't, I'm terrified of experiencing mm. that. So I'll have to like throw all the tricks I can into this, rehearse it, write it, rehearse it. So I worked on something for like eight months that like I was really proud of it, but I didn't start it the proper way, which is just like you meant to just get to an open mic night and start and, and like the scrap of paper that you wrote your five jokes on, say them. Um, so man, that's advice I can take and always keep reminding myself of. It's massive. I, um, again, I, this is the longest outro ever, but one more <laughs> thing. I went to every like three months, um, my partner and I would go on like a date night mm -hmm. and COVID stopped it. We go into the city and we go to this thing called... Um, conspiracy what's it called when you um when you go up and like just act with like nothing there what's it? improv it's called oh yeah the, yeah the conspiracy improv improv yeah so like, you go there we don't know anyone there mm. it's like a really small community it's like 10 people in the crowd yeah and it's just this like group of people and they go up and do improv mm. and i look at them and i'm like i just have nothing but admiration for these people like they are just putting themselves out there like just getting up there someone yells a word word like they're not professionals by any means but they're do, doing it to enjoy himself like I don't, I don't i dare say i don't think any of them are going to be on hollywood or anything like mm. that but i nearly like just even watching that get like inspiration from it just going fuck yeah. me this is like it's such an unbelievable thing so i i couldn't applaud them more i love people that put themselves out of their comfort and I, I think more people should appreciate that like i what i can't understand about trolls and like people who attack people for like putting themselves out there is like you, do you even realize how hard it is to make that first step mm. and to go to be vulnerable enough to go hey i'm making something for the world this is what it looks like regardless of the quality of it it that is admirable in itself to be able to do that and i i reckon a lot of the time like the people who love to chip people down about that or, or you know troll them or even if you're um I don't know. Like you, you just you, you're trying to bring that down. Mm. Um, just like think about how hard it is, and would you ever do that? And would you ever put yourself out like that? Yeah. Um, yeah. Didn't know I'd come up <laughs> come no, up against trolls in no, the end of this interview. I know, but <laughs> I know, it, we do talk about trolls a lot. We, yeah, it is. It is such a fascinating. But like, for example, you know, you play a lot of music on your socials, and even mm. that, for example, is something that I admire so mm. much. I'm like, fuck, I couldn't do that. Not oh, man, because I just don't have the skill, but like I couldn't sing in front of people. Man, like, it, take, it takes a long, like I, I tell you, I've been making stuff for a long time and it takes a long time. And I still, even when I started putting those songs up on my Instagram and, and TikTok and stuff, I, I was still nervous about doing that because I was like, oh, this isn't really like comedy. And I've never really just put up like a, me singing a song before. And so I still struggle with it. And... People still want to bring you down, but fuck it. You just got to like, go, you just got to like, you're killing yourself 
if if you're if you're holding that back from the world and you want to put it out there do you know um who you remind me a little bit of have you heard of um bo burnham i love bo burnham oh man i love inside which is his new comedy it, special i thought was incredible is it the most like i feel like honestly that's uh, your musical um ability is a little bit like that you're a storyteller it's funny but it's also like really like touching and that's when i listen to bo burnham um i was listening to one of his songs the other day and i was like oh my god this is like the funniest thing but i'm also like crying and like questioning is he actually okay like through it, it's, yeah, it's the unbelievable thing about the, the comedy special is like some of the songs is like oh this isn't even a joke like yeah this is like a really great song yeah <laughs> um mate thank you so much for coming on the show um so nice to finally meet you as i said i feel like we've been friends for 15 years um you just didn't know it yet yeah. <laughs> and it's it's so good to, to yeah finally meet you man like i'm honored to have you in hope we can continue our friendship is that cool with oh you? i'd love that man maybe Thank we should go to a carlton Nissen game i'd like that yeah carlton Nissen always put on a good game as well mm. i feel like there's always like a goal in it me you tommy bell chambers <laughs> get tommy mcdonald <laughs> if he's not <laughs> tommy McDonald, if he's i can't not. go with any other yeah. footballers <laughs> yeah, so. yeah. Oh, yeah. i'm gonna keep you away from my mates just in case you really weird them out yeah. um mate thank you so much again uh, thanks for and me, um yeah if anyone's out there listening to, to jack road studios make sure you get around that yep. christian o'connell in the mornings um and if you've heard of hamish and andy check them out as well i'm yep. not sure if you've heard of them but uh, <laughs> that'd be good bro thanks so much thanks man